So yeah, I have um, an issue with your stance on abortion. Okay. Right. So you define life as starting at conception through biology, pretty, right? Pretty much. But I think you take the stance that life is intrinsically valuable because it's life. And that's where I disagree. I think there's two things that make life valuable. I think consciousness, the ability to experience pain, senses and stuff like that, and personal identity. In particular, uh, psychological continuity identity. So the fact that we have memories, we have relationships, people have relationships to us. I think those are Do you two need both of those or is it neither or? I just want to clarify um, your position. Either or. Okay, so if it's either or, then people with Alzheimer's have real continuity problems, you can't kill them. No, because people still have um, relationships with them though, right? So like just because well, you have like... I mean, you have a relationship with them, but with people with advanced stage Alzheimer's, they really don't have a relationship okay, with them. Okay, but for the sake of example, like let's say someone dies, right? The family gets to decide what you do with the body. Because I know what you say, when, it, when you say someone says, oh, it's just consciousness, and then they're brain dead, you say, well, can you stab them? No, you can't, because that's the family's decision what to do with the body. It's the person's decision what they so want to do. So if the family decides to stab them, it's okay to stab the, the When they're brain dead? Yeah, if they want to pull No, not, not, not brain dead. Let's say that you're comatose for a, for a specifically and predictably short period of time, say nine months. Say so now, well, what, what is the person? <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. I saw. So, so I would say uh, on the, the legal grounds, it would depend if the, what the person put in their will. If the person has made clear statements like, hey, don't pull the plug on nine months, then don't do that. Because I think the first choice is. Right, get, but let's say the person has not made such clear statements. Say the person can't make such clear statements. So, that, and he's just in a complete coma? The, the, let's say the person has not drawn up a living will or had conversations like this. They so go into, they're in a car crash, they so get in a coma. Say, you know that in nine months they're going to come out of the coma and they're going to be fine. Are you allowed to stab? Is so, wait, the family so, say, you know what, so these nine months, fine, they're stab the dude. Wait, so they're let's fine, so they're thing. going to get their memories back? Um, let's say they don't get their memories back. Then I would say that that person is dead. And yeah, if the family wants to pull the plug, that's fine. <laughs> I'd have no problem with that, yeah. No, I would have no problem with that. Because that, like, cause that, per like, that person is dead. You're getting dead. into some dicey territory, dude. No, I think that person is dead. <laughs> Right? And the, that's the best way to define life, is personal identity and consciousness. That's what makes life valuable. Right, so I think that, again, if you were to say both, that's too much. And if you were to even to say either, I don't think either one of those legs stands on its own. Okay, because what you really mean, th this is the thing about having a baby. It's a process of development. Okay? And this is the point that I'm making. There's yeah. a period in this human life when that child does not have, or fetus or embryo, whatever you want to call it, when this living thing does not have consciousness and does not have a sense of identity. But in nine months, it will have consciousness. Well, and even then, even by, the like way, by the way, babies, away. babies don't have a sense of identity for at least, for, for at, least a certain number of months after they're born. I mean, they um, babies, this, the babies can uh, recognize their parents' voices after they're born. That's not a sense of identity. Rats can No, no, identify. no, I would say it is, because it, it's, no, it's a form of memory, though. Right, and that's what I was uh, using. So, my... are, so are you a Jainist? Because animals also have consciousness. No, yeah, no, I would identity. say that killing animals is wrong. You have no problem with that. So just to get this straight. <laughs> killing, killing Fluffy the hamster, deeply wrong. <laughs> killing a dude who wakes up from a, who's going to wake up from a coma in nine months with memory problems, totally cool. <laughs> Uh, uh, the fact of stem cell research, as many people in this room no doubt are aware, stem cell research is one of the most promising lines in, in biology to generate medical therapies. Uh, and it is not being funded at the federal level uh, for reasons that are religious, but for re because, because we have this idea that based on uh, rather vague uh, notions of theology that in every fertilized ovum there is a soul and you can't privilege the, the interests of one soul over another, even if one is in a Petri dish and the other is in a, a man with Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, it's, a lot has been said in this conference about science not being able to answer questions of morality. Well, I think this is a question of morality that science has answered. Uh, if you look at the details, if you look at the, the human embryos that are destroyed in stem cell research, uh, what is a three-day-old human embryo? It is a collection of 150 cells. Uh, that may sound like a lot of cells to, 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 to lay people, it does, but there are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Uh, now, we, it seems to me, if, if our concern is about suffering in this universe, uh, it is rather obvious that we should be more concerned about killing flies 
than about killing three-day-old human embryos. Now, this, this may sound like a very provocative claim. I would argue that it shouldn't if you look at the details. Now, many people, of course, will argue, well, the difference between a fly and a three-day-old human embryo is that a, a, a three-day-old human embryo is a potential human being. Uh, this runs into problems. Every cell in your body, given the right manipulations, every cell with a nucleus, is now a potential human being. I mean, literally, every time you scratch your nose, you have committed a holocaust of potential human beings. Uh, so the, the argument for, for a cell's potential doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, but let's, let's take this a little bit further. Let's say we granted that every three-day-old human embryo has a soul worthy of our moral concern. Uh, there are other problems that await this, uh, this uh, description. First of all, embryos at this stage can split into what we call identical twins. Uh, now, is this a case of, of one soul splitting into two souls? Embryos at this stage can fuse into what we call a chimera. There are many people in this room could have developed in this way. Now, I, I suspect that there are theologians trying to figure out what has happened to the extra human soul in such a case. Uh, it, it's time we realize that this arithmetic of souls doesn't make any sense. It's intellectually indefensible, but it is morally indefensible given that these notions really are prolonging the scarcely endurable misery of tens of millions of human beings. And because, uh, because of the respect we accord religious faith, not even just people of faith, even advocates of stem cell research uh, accord this the, the faith respect, uh, we can't have this, this dialogue uh, in the way that we should. So I submit to you that if, if you think that the, the, the interests of a blastocyst, a three-day-old human embryo, just may trump the interests of a little girl with spinal cord injury or, or a person with full body burns, uh, your moral intuitions have been obscured by religious metaphysics. Uh, and this is a kind of blindness that is very well subscribed in our society. And it's a blindness that goes by another name. It goes by the name of religious faith. And we have been cowed into respecting it. This. Abortion is, is, is put forward as the liberation of women. On the contrary, it has been, especially since the 1967 Act, the liberation of irresponsible and selfish men who were not prepared to fulfill their responsibility. <laughs> that, 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 that is one of the reasons why it remains so politically popular. Secondly, we're told by Mara that she, she wishes to be absolutely autonomous in this matter, that the person who, who, has, who has the baby needs to be absolutely autonomous and has to have the decision entirely left to herself. Well, first of all, a baby is not a disease uh, or, a medical, or, or, or a medical problem. Didn't it is a new was. life. And secondly, there is a baby involved. And it seems to me that if you are going to insist so very furiously on the individual rights of the woman, then you cannot conceivably ignore or deny or simply sweep aside the, the, the right to life of the baby. And it is absurd to, yeah. to, 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 treat the one, to treat the one as absolute and the other as non-existent. My own view has been... I, the, the, the question of rape or incest is very difficult indeed for, for anybody who values human life. But my own point that I would make to almost anybody is can anybody really, really deep inside their consciousness, having seen a, a living baby, and indeed babies, many babies now born at, at, at stages where they can be aborted, who's seen a living baby, can any of them really say that the killing of that baby, a human person, was a better solution than the adoption of that baby by somebody else. If the mother really does not want the baby, there are plenty of people who do. Mara. I don't think anybody in this country under the age of, uh, over the age of 11 who doesn't know how babies are made. Contraception has never been so readily available. You can, go, you, can, you, can go, you can walk into a, chemi you can walk into a chemist shop and get a morning after pill. The, the, a large number of abortions, as you well know, are, 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 are not first abortions or even second abortions or even third, but fourth and fifth abortions yeah, yeah. by the same people. Yeah. This is being used as contraception because, the, because b partly because of the policy that's been encouraged. In the old Soviet Union, where it was encouraged much as it was here, the, in the end, the number of abortions outnumbered live births. And we, 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 we could approach that position. But the real problem with... We taking, also have the problem the, no, there of is gender. A, there is a real problem, a conscience problem, taking away yes, the law. We, yes, we, we also have the feeling of, of sex selection. No, at at may I just make this very, very important point? Which is at getting worse in this country. At, in India, at, pres at, females present, are right. at present, yeah. a doctor right. or a nurse or a midwife who refuses to, on grounds of conscience, to be involved in performing an abortion can pretty much do so. Once the decriminalizers have got their way, the pressure will be on those doctors 
who, and nurses who, in conscience, do not wish to do this, to do it. And the whole, the whole situation will turn over from one where it's fundamentally a bad thing to one where it's fundamentally a good thing and everyone has to like it. I have a, bear with me, a relatively long question here. After admitting that an unborn child is a human being, you write on page 221, and I, thankfully you, you say in the book that it's nonsense that an unborn child is not a human being. You admit that the unborn child is. You say this, and I quote, there may be circumstances in which it is not desirable to carry a fetus to full term. You then go on to advocate termination of pregnancy if birth control fails. Here's my question. Why is it that according to you, when God plays God by taking a life prematurely, in the Old Testament, for example, it is a moral outrage. But when you play God by taking a life prematurely through abortion, it is a moral right. Well, that's a false distinction. I mean, I don't, that's not what I say. I mean, I say that the, the great abortifacient is, I would say, nature. I don't say God. Of course, God does not decide. That so many pregnancies are not carried to full term. Uh, nature knows... Uh, in the case of our species, as with every other mammal and primate, uh, that some uh, fetuses are not going to make it and flushes them out. That's just a brute fact. Um, we wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case because we are, as you know, adapted uh, biologically to an, uh, to an environment we've abandoned, the savanna. That's why we have appendices that are designed for grass eaters and you know all of this. It's, it's all very well knowable. You can't be having a, a brood of sickly uh, half-baked children and get away from the predators. I mean, uh, so nature is the great abortifacient. I certainly don't blame God for it. I do, as a humanist, th believe that the concept unborn child is a real one, and I think the concept is, is um, underlined by all the recent findings of embryology that, uh, and about the, the early viability of a well-conceived uh, human baby, the one that isn't going to be critically deformed, or even some uh, that are. Uh, will be able to survive outside the womb earlier and earlier and earlier. And I see that data only being pushed, pushed back. And I feel a responsibility to consider the occupant of the, of the womb as a candidate member of society uh, in the future. And thus to say that it cannot be only the responsibility of the woman uh, to decide upon it. That it's a social question and an ethical and a moral one. And I say this as someone who has no supernatural belief. So your question ought to have been this. How do I have any ethical opinions since I don't believe that I'm created? And I don't believe I'm going to heaven. I prefer hell. the first question, if you don't Right, mind. but okay. But I mean, it, it just isn't it entailed by it? I've, have mm -hmm. I, well, I appeal to the audience. Have I not answered the question about the termination of pregnancy? Which bit have I not answered? You better prompt me then. I'll read it again. Why is it that according to you, when God plays God by taking a life prematurely... Well, I don't, I, it isn't according to me. God, I don't say God does that. You, Nature in, does in your it. book, um, which is right over here, you have an entire chapter about the atrocities in the Old Testament. Yes. And the atrocities have to do with God commanding genocide and, and those things. Um, and, oh. and, and you obviously have a problem with that, as many people should. Um, so my question again is, why, according to you, when God plays God by taking a life prematurely in the Old Testament, is it a moral outrage, but when you play God by taking a life prematurely through an abortion, it is a moral right? Well, once again, I'm, I'm sorry if my work is so obscure, but I don't say that I have a moral right to terminate a pregnancy. I've given all the reasons that I think hedge that question ethically and morally very sternly, very stringently. Um, and in any case, it's not like saying that every living child of the Amalekites should be destroyed. And, an, and a, a, an injunction by God to Moses to say he's been too merciful, he spared too many children and enslaved too few women uh, and didn't make the genocide complete. I, I'm sorry, I've, I've never been accused of, and I expect not to be, uh, if I'm lucky enough in my life of any such thing. And the, the idea that there's a moral equivalence between the two or handling the, the really difficult question of, a, of um, an unviable fetus and what should be done about it um, isn't a moral equivalence at all. So do you want to say that all unborn life is, like you say in the book, is a human being and therefore you should not kill it? Is that what you want to say to get out of this dilemma? Or what do you want to no, say? But I think, no, but I think the presumption, that I've, I've long said that the presumption is uh, that 
the, 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 the unborn entity uh, has a right on its side and that every effort should be made to see if it can be preserved. And I think that's, I think that's an ethical imperative. I, what I do say in the book is I think the Roman Catholic Church makes this argument uh, immoral when it could be uh, a moral one by saying that contraception is not to be allowed by saying that contraception is the moral equivalent of abortion. In other words, to say that contraception is also murder, which is a nonsensical and disproportionate position. I quote some serious Catholics in my book, William F. Buckley, the late is one, Claire Booth Luce is another, by saying, if the church says that contraception and abortion are morally the same, it degrades the opposition to abortion. Right. Um, and by making absurd uh, uh, arguments, as it has in the past, Aquinas believed that every single sperm contained a microembryo inside it. And thus that, if you like, I hope I don't offend anyone, hand jobs are genocide. Um, as for blow jobs, don't start. Um, uh, that, uh, that an ectopic pregnancy, in other words, a direct threat to the life of the mother, a fallopian tube pregnancy, is instead of a direct threat to the life of the mother and an obvious no starter for a human embryo, because that's going anyway, is, is uh, someone who should be allowed to vote. This is nonsense. It's casuistry, it's immoral, it's superstition, and it prevents people from thinking seriously about matters that humanism can decide for itself, for heaven's sake, without any supernatural intervention. The question, uh, this is Dr. Anthony Levitino. Dr. Levitino is a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist. Over the course of his career, Dr. Levitino has practiced obstetrics and gynecology in both private and university settings, including as an associate professor of OBGYN at the Albany Medical College. And Dr. Levitino, we'll begin with you. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to get right to it. Second trimester d &E abortions performed between roughly 14 and 24 weeks of gestation. Your patient today is 17 years old. She's 22 weeks pregnant. Her baby is the length of your hand plus a couple of inches. And she's been feeling her baby kick for the last several weeks, but she's asleep on an operating room table. You walk into that operating room scrubbed and gowned, and after removing laminaria, you introduce a suction catheter into the uterus. This is a 14 French suction catheter. If she were 12 weeks pregnant or less, basically the width of your hand or smaller, you could basically do the entire procedure with this. But babies this big don't fit through catheters this size. After suctioning the amniotic fluid out from around the baby, you introduce an instrument called a sofa clamp. It's about 13 inches long. It's made of stainless steel. The business end of this clamp is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide. There are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. A d &E procedure is a blind abortion, so picture yourself introducing this and grabbing anything you can blindly and pull, and I do mean hard, and out pops a leg about that big, which you put down on the table next to you. Reach in again, pull again, and pull out an arm about the same length, which you put down on the table next to you, and use this instrument again and again to tear out the spine, the intestines, the heart and lungs. Head in the baby that size is about the size of a large plum, can't see it, but you pretty good idea you've got it if you've got your instrument around something and your fingers are spread about as far as they go. You know you did it right if you crush down on the instrument and white material runs out of the cervix. That was the baby's brains. Then you could pull out skull pieces. And you have a day like I had a lot of times, sometimes a little face comes back and stares back at you. Congratulations, you just successfully performed a second trimester DNA abortion. You just affirmed her right to choose. One more question, Dr. Levitino. Why did you end your practice of doing abortions? I did over 1,200 abortions over a four-year period in private practice, not counting the ones that I did during my training. Um, I met my wife at, um, during my first year of training at Albany Medical Center. We got married about a year later and found that we had an infertility problem. After years of failed infertility treatment and several years trying to adopt a child, we were blessed with a, adopting a, a little girl that we named Heather. And, August of 1978. Um, as sometimes happens in those situations, my wife got pregnant the very next month, and we had two children 10 months apart. Um, two months short of my daughter Heather's sixth birthday, she was killed in an auto accident and literally died in her arms in the back of an ambulance. Anyone who has children might think they have some idea of what that feels like, but unless you've been through it yourself, you have no idea whatsoever. Um, 
I know people find it hard to believe, but uh, what do you do after disaster? You bury your child and then you go back to your life. And I don't remember exactly how long it was after my daughter died that I showed up at Albany Medical Center OR number nine to perform my first second trimester d &E abortion. I wasn't thinking of it as anything special. This was routine to me. Um, but I reached in, literally pulled out an arm or leg and got sick. You know, earlier on I described stacking up body parts on the side of the table. It's not to, you know, gross people out, to use a simple term. When you do an, an abortion, you need to keep inventory. You have to make sure you get two arms and two legs and all the pieces. If you don't, your patient's going to come back infected, bleeding, or dead. Um, so I soldiered on and finished that abortion. And I know it sounds, as I said, hard for people to believe, but I'm, I'm telling you straight up my experience. You know, after over 1,200 abortions, first and second trimester up to 24 weeks and all the rest of it, and being very dedicated to it, for the first time in my life, I really looked. I really looked at that pile of body parts on the side of the table. And I didn't see her wonderful right to choose, and I didn't see all the money I just made. All I could see was somebody's son or daughter. And I stopped doing late-term abortions after that, and several months later stopped doing all abortions.